Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. It has been such a pleasure. This was uh, one of the most fun events I think I've been to ever. Uh, what a great, uh, what a great atmosphere, and you know what great energy everyone has here. Last night was really un unbelievable, and uh, everyone that's participated, everyone that's participated has just been awesome, and uh, uh, I've had, I've had a great time. Uh, you know, Judy and I were, um, uh, we're going over some of the things this morning. We're gonna go over, we're gonna go over some questions, and uh, uh, and then we're gonna uh, head into the book a little bit. There is so much important uh, important information in in the book, and you know one of the great things one of the great things about uh, taking somebody through the steps is once once you've got them through the steps and they really have that spiritual connection, they're not calling you up with personal drama anymore. You know what the, you know what the you know what the questions are. I got this new guy, and I don't know what to do. It's, it's phenomenal. I would so much rather answer questions like that than, than you know, my wife's not acting right, you know, kind of questions. Uh, it's just so much more, uh, so much more productive. So, you know, what I was able to do in my early, uh, early years um, was I, the the guys that uh, would come over to my house and go through the steps, the people that took it seriously and moved through became my crew you, you know they became my crew and now all of a sudden you know we it was a team sport and uh, and we were out there trying to help other people and going to meetings together and you know going to conventions and things like to get that together and I think somewhere deep inside that's what I've always wanted you know I I, I never really had friends I had the type of people who would share my bottle or whatever with me but you know, I never had that that true kinship, that true wonderful uh, type of friendship that that I had when you know I, I, I started uh, I started working with others. There was a period of time I, I was very lucky. I, I was able to live. Uh, uh, I was a facility manager, and they gave me a house so that I would be close to the facility I was managing. It was a big, huge house with enormous parking. And you know, every every single night, practically, there were there were people over uh, on the weekends. There were people over, you know, Saturday and Sunday, and we were all really enthusiastic and you know, really excited about uh, about this recovery stuff. And we're, you know, we're doing steps together and doing commitments together. And you know, a lot of the promises that we're we're going to read a little bit later in the 12 step promises, you know, came true to me. And uh, my life did take on new meaning. And <clears throat> If you have not started to work with other people yet, uh, I can't tell you there. I, I, I can tell you this: that it's been the most uh, most exciting thing in my life. It's been incredibly. It brought me back out into the world. I, I was like the last five years of my drinking. <clears throat> I was like Gollum, you know. I mean, I was holed up in a room talking to the bottle, my precious, you know. I just sit and sitting there, sitting there drinking this alcohol. It was. Uh, and I, you know, I was gone, you know, where was Chris, you know, people living in the same town, you know, I haven't seen him in years, and I just, I just isolated, I, I was, you know, I was not really fit for human company, but, uh, but the loneliness that the alcoholic feels is just, it's, you can cut that loneliness with a knife. And one of the wonderful promises in AA is, uh, you can come out of that, you know, you can come out of that cave. And you can start to become part of uh, part of humanity again. How, Judy, how about some questions? All right. How do you work with a chronic relapser uh, any differently? You know, I don't know how Judy does this, but I'll allow some flexibility with a sponsee. Uh, <clears throat> I'll allow a, a, an amount of flexibility with a sponsee. Y you know, I'm not a dictator. I will uh, I will show someone the next direction that I would like them to take, but you know I'm not going to be I'm not going to be overly militant about it until they relapse. If they relapse, the book says when when you have a relapse, the the instruction that I read in the book is you must redouble your efforts. That's what the book says. So I let them know that it's time to start redoubling our efforts. You know, you weren't doing enough 
to get that connection to the power to be safe and protected. And we need to be about that business. And I'll, I'll start to get more and more uh, insistent that we, that we do this. And, you know, uh, I, I worked with two guys. And I normally don't do this, but these were two childhood friends of mine. And I would not give up on them. And I, you know, uh, one of them is dead now. The other is still alive. And I will not give up on the, the, these individuals. The big problem I saw with them was they just couldn't get past their atheism. They could not believe that, that, that there was a power that could help them. And that's the only thing I think that explains because they would be willing to go to meetings. They'd be willing to sponsor people. They'd be willing to drive people to the meetings. They were very, very busy, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they did a good portion of step work. But they were never able to get that connection to, to the power. And, I, and I, ha I have a feeling that it was, it was basically because, because of, uh, of the belief system. Before you move on, I want to say that it's really important. I know Chris and I agree on this. It is not a personal failure because you relapse. That has to do with a person and their God. I am not a better or worse rela um, sponsor for someone's relapse. So I know the question always comes, what have I missed? What have I done wrong? Don't go there. <coughs> Uh, yeah, Judy, Judy's right, you know, uh, just because they're making us look bad, uh, you know. Uh, what the book says is that God has either removed his obsession to drink or he hasn't. And, and you know, I, I believe that, you know, it is about, it is about that, uh, that connection, that connection to God. And Bill Wilson was very compassionate about this. He would say, there are people who cannot or will not give themselves to this simple program. Cannot or will not. He didn't. He didn't say there are idiots out there who are too stupid. He said. He said there are people who cannot or will not, one or the other, give themselves to this to this simple simple program. So again, uh, I think it was. Be, it's been said too. I'm not about shaming anybody. And when somebody calls me up and they're all remorseful, Chris, I drank on you. You know, I'm so. I'm like, look, look, man, that you know, don't, never ever feel uncomfortable about calling me if you have if you have a relapse the the american medical association categorizes alcoholism as a chronically relapsing condition that if you go to a doctor and you tell him you're an alcoholic in his manual it says this is a person who is going to chronically relapse on you you, you know so so we are the exceptions folks we have found a, a solution and you know we're trying to bring other people to the solution and there are going to be people who cannot or will not give themselves to this simple program it was mentioned that it's possible sometimes necessary to walk someone through the steps quickly uh, like within a week or so what would that look like well you know I don't do it every time but there are times when I'm just I intuitively know that we we need to get moving and uh, uh, you know, what I'll do is I'll take them through steps one, two, and three in a meeting. I'll give them instructions for step four. They'll come back with about half a step four done. I'll make sure that it's, that it's being done at least sufficiently. You know, we're never going to do this perfectly, and we're never going to do it all the way. We're going to do it uh, as we're capable at that time. But I'll give them some direction if I see that they're missing some of the bigger chunks of truth about themselves. And then I'll set up a meeting for step five. We'll do step five, and then I'll ask them uh, to do uh, up, uh, upon returning home. Upon, upon returning home, we take the book down from our shelves, and we, you know, we make an assessment of the first five steps. Have we left anything out? Then I give them instructions on steps six, six, uh, six and seven. You know, uh, do some meditation, uh, ask for the willingness, and then ask God to remove those character defects and then the next time I see them I explain to them how they need to put their list together so I help them with their list and then and at that period of time I we come together and we 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 uh, in a in a spirit of partnership we come to an understanding and an acceptance of how the approach should be made for an amends 
and you know how, what, what's going to be involved in that amends. And then I ask them to go out there and start amends. In the meantime, while they're doing these amends, I, br I, I go through steps 10 and I go st through steps 11 in a simple way if it's the first time they've been exposed to it and I show them how to gain some power through the prayer and the meditation and some of the disciplines in steps 10 and 11. Folks, the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it and there's discipline involved in living it. And I'll tell them how I do it. This, you know, this is basically how I do it. And as soon as they can, I'll have them helping other alcoholics. We're going to read some stuff that'll, that'll show how important that is. Now, should the guy who just went through the steps in the first week, you know, be out there sponsoring? You know, that's certainly subject to, uh, to discussion. But they can be out there helping other alcoholics. They can be out there helping alcoholics. Now, how long do you think something like that takes? Depends on how many nights they're willing to meet with me and how much writing they do. Uh, these, these steps were not designed as long-term therapy, you know, in their initial uh, approach. They were developed for people that Bill and Bob were pulling out of the drunk tanks, you know, and getting them busy on day one. And in the early days of AA, there were people at the door. We're talking the 30s and 40s. There were people at the door. And you weren't allowed into the meetings if you didn't mean business. And what mean business was is, is he working on the steps? Today, we'll let you through the door, you, you know, the craziest people in the world. Come on in, you know. Back in the day, if you weren't working with somebody and you weren't in the steps, they didn't want you in the meeting. They didn't want you sharing in the meeting. You know, they wanted, they wanted people who meant business. And they got the people. There was a couple of periods of time in AA's history when uh, the media discovered us, the Jack Alexander article and a number of other things. And all of a sudden, a gazillion letters and phone calls came into to general service. And they, they almost didn't have enough people to go out on all these 12-step calls. So as soon as they got a guy off of booze and, you know, uh, and the triage step work in a couple of days, they had him out working with other people and, going on and answering some of the other letters. You know, uh, we have stretched out the time. Sometimes we've stretched it out too long and, and people relapse because they're not busy enough with the action of, uh, of the steps. Uh, what if your sponsor doesn't return your call or text? Can you get a new sponsor? <laughs> I see somebody in a red shirt that probably, uh, probably wrote that. There's all kinds of sponsorship. There's a kind of sponsor who never calls a sponsee. Never. Okay? And then there's, then there's more of a collaborative approach where they each call each other. If we have an awakened spirit because of the steps, we're going to intuitively know how to handle situations. Some people are so shy uh, and have so, such you know, disastrous self-esteem problems, they, it's, you know, picking up that phone is just going to be you know, too much. And, you know, I'll reach out to them. Uh, I don't do anything like cookie cutter. I really try to put myself in their shoes and try to figure out how would, you know, how would they like to, to uh, how is how's it best comfortable for them to be approached. Uh, my sponsor fired me after I made a suggestion. Why do I feel so bad? I don't think you should feel so bad. You know what happens when a sponsor fires you, you say, God bless you, go in peace. <laughs> you, you know, we have no ownership. There's brands, of, there's brands of, of sponsorship that are dictatorial. You know, they're hierarchical. You know, the orders come down from on high. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not one of those. And, and, you know, there are people who cannot or will not <laughs> give themselves to this, uh, this simple program. And, and you know what? Uh, that, that's okay. Uh, you know, I'm not, in my early days of, of working with other people, I, I was interested in quantity. You know, Chris, how many people do you sponsor? 50. How many of them do you really sponsor? About four. <laughs> you know, I, I'm way more interested in quality today than I am in quantity. Uh, I want to teach the people who are going to teach. I want to work with the people who are going to work with others because that's the best thing for our fellowship. I don't want to spend a ton of time with a taker. 
you know, who's going to be gone in three months. I, you know, I want somebody that's going to get through the work, have that awakening, and then continue to work with other people. And I wasted an enormous amount of time trying to be, you know, the, un, uh, the untrained drama coach, you, you know. And, uh, and you know, I, that, just, that just, didn't, just didn't work as well as, you, you know, I'm, try, I'm trying to give them advice on their jackpot, you, you know, I, I mean, it just it just really wasn't wasn't working for me. Here's one. This is kind of a long one. How do I shut up uh, the people uh, in a healthy way? And you know them. Uh, they are sharing in a meeting, and all of a sudden, your uh, uh, you know your group kicks in, and you know. All right, the the unruly people in the closed-minded discussion meetings. Okay. <laughs> we we all have experienced that, right? Um, what I can tell you is after having a spiritual awakening, the bright spot of your life will be frequent contact with newcomers. Is frequent contact with newcomers uncomfortable to you? You know, there's step work to do. Um, you know, and I'll tell you what, we have a home group. We had a home group in New Jersey that I was part of. I'm in Connecticut now. But if someone just wanted to raise their hand and share, it's a big book, big book discussion meeting, big book presentation meeting. Somebody would just want to share. I mean, they're used to sharing in detox or whatever, and they just want to come in and share, 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 share. share. We'll, 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 walk to, we'll walk with them out of the meeting. We're not going to embarrass them, but we'll walk with them out of the meeting, and we'll say, hey, you know, do you have a sponsor? Uh, and it's usually, well, not really. Well, do, do you want a sponsor? It sounds like you need a sponsor. <laughs> and and well, like some subtle loving pressure. And one of, one of two things will happen. The loud mouth will leave or the loud mouth will get a sponsor and start working the steps. Either one of those are fine with us. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You know, we, you know we, this is about attraction, not promotion. So... Um, you know, we're we're all going to have we're all going to have difficult uh, difficult experiences in home groups. Uh, that's just kind of what uh, kind of what will happen. I'm going to bring Judy up. Judy, come on. Up. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want I want to make another thought on that too, as well as and and I say this as a woman more than than anything else. Um, I think it's possible to share inappropriately at a meeting. You've all been there, not just the babbler, but us. I found some feelings. I want to tell you all about my most intimate thoughts because you're all my friends. That's what a sponsor's for. Don't go there either. Um, and I think people don't know that. They think that meetings are for everybody to share their soul because they've been trained to do that. Alcoholics Anonymous meetings are there for people Open meetings are different than closed meetings. We all know that. But um, I think it's helpful to get new people and let them know that there's a place to share that. And usually that's with your sponsor. Um, which leads me to a question. I have a question about what are your thoughts on gender and sexuality when working with others? As far as I can tell, we don't have gender issues and sexuality issues as alcoholics. What we have is alcoholics. We don't have brown alcoholics, black alcoholics, gay alcoholics. What we have is alcoholics. And I would prefer to look at it that way. I, I actually am a co-founder of a meeting in Spanish, and I had about four words of Spanish. So I'd say, si. <laughs> um, and I learned a few more. Now I can carry on a conversation a little bit. Um, if you don't use too many inside slang words. But, um, and the reason for doing that was that there aren't very many women in Spanish-speaking meetings, and I wanted there to be a woman for when that woman came in the door. I wanted someone to be there to greet her, and I didn't know any other way to provide that, so I went. And I figured between a Spanish-speaking AA book and an English-speaking big book, we could get the job done. And I've been waiting now about 22 years, and she hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> but I've learned some Spanish. And um, so um, it's been a great experience. So in terms of sexuality, I'd like to just share with you a story. Um, back when we were um, about, actually about 21 years ago, 
Um, we had a, a guy who was known to be a predator in the community, a um, little weasel man, and um, I got pretty angry because I sponsor women and I'm reasonably protective of the women I sponsor. And he used to carry a blanket around in his trunk just in case, that kind of stuff. Ugh. And um, so word got around and we had a lot of new people coming in and we were like, how are we going to take care of our new girls? We got to surround them at meetings. We've got to invite them in and give them choices because it's not always the guy's fault any more than it's the guy's fault when some cougar's after him either. But the issue does come up because it's part of who we are. And um, so we decided in our, in our enthusiasm that we would hold a meeting at our house on um, sexuality and invite all the new women. And I'm in a college town. So my sponsee, who's a nurse, came and brought her little condom example on how you do that. And we had this little meeting, and it got out that it was, and it got out under the title of Sex with Judy. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we had a great afternoon, and we felt like we'd informed all these women. Nine months later, two children was born, and one of them became my grandson, who just celebrated his 20th birthday while we were here. <laughs> We've never had enough nerve to try that again, <laughs> but we gave it our best shot. Sexuality issues are close right under alcoholism, and I think of them like any other issue. I have sponsored a couple of men, but not very successfully, and I have been sponsored by men, but very successfully, but they have to be healed men who can do their life in an upfront uh, level <coughs> with integrity. When I got here, I could not hear a woman's voice. I got here, I could only hear a man's voice. And the two men that have had the most impact in my life have been the two men that particularly sponsored me and I didn't get sleep with and I didn't know the difference when I got here. I didn't know the difference between loving somebody and not sleeping with somebody. I just didn't know that difference. And <clears throat> it is you men with integrity that taught me that. Um, so I have to, to say that I, I, I don't think it's always appropriate. I don't even think it's always good, but sometimes it is. And we have to depend on each other to carry something that a gentleman was good enough to bring up to me yesterday. And he said, you know, you're not talking a lot about the psychic change necessary. We have to become a different person than the person we came in as. And if I'm not different from the person I came in as and the person I am today, you got a different person here at the podium. You need a different person here at the podium. I have to be different in order to live my life in the community. If I'm the same person I was then, that would be really a shame because I would have no message to give. So our message comes, and it's written right in the very beginning of the book, that we have to be different, that we are different, and we walk a different path than the one that we came in at. And so, so many of us have a lot of history that that's really useful, but we have to become different. So um, thank you to all those people that walk with integrity and honesty and the principles, because they don't change based on circumstances. Principles don't change on circumstances. They just don't. So um, somebody had a question about multiple personalities. And we have in my home group a number of mentally ill people. They're getting some sobriety. One of my very favorites is a guy that just celebrated five years and is hoping that he'll get a sponsee. He said, I know the answer to recovery is in having sponsorship, being a sponsor. And do you think anybody will ever ask me to sponsor them? And our fellow in our meeting is just a great guy, and he's got chronic mental illness. It's part of who he is. But our home group is big enough to have two or three of those people. We're a little odd at dinner sometimes, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, we are, but it's room enough to find sobriety, regardless of the mental illness. You can have sobriety. We should not put people in a separate category because of that in my, in my uh, way of thinking. So quick multiple personality story. I sponsor a woman who lives in a rural town. There's not much there. And they tend to combine all of their 12-step groups. And somebody came up to her and said, I have multiple personalities. Would you be willing to sponsor me? 
she said she took a deep breath because she didn't know anything about multiple personalities. But she went on instinct and she took a deep breath and she said, I don't know how to do this exactly because we tell the truth. But I'd like you to go back and ask if one of those people was willing to get sober. <laughs> and that's the one I'd like to invite up. <laughs> and she sponsored the woman for a long time, whoever that person is. So that's part of my, uh, that's part of my stuff. Uh, there were a number of questions about how do you end or change sponsorship. One of the things that's an indicator of personality change is graciousness. You see it in a lot of people. There's a graciousness, there's a consideration, there's thoughtfulness. So it's really nice if we're able to say thank you. You have given me the one thing, the one thing in life that's irreplaceable. Chris talked about it. You've given me your time. You will never get an hour back that you spend with anybody. That hour is gone forever, so how did you spend it? And if you gave me of your time, you gave me of the one value in your life that is irreplaceable. What a gift, no matter how that sponsorship relationship works out long term, what a gift, and we need to appreciate and value that and say thank you for that. Thank you for your time, your willingness to meet with me. I need to go be sponsored somewhere else or whatever is the issue we thank them buy them a cup of coffee usually and um, hopefully we've made a friend as well the time is so critically important so what if your sponsor is not willing to move forward she's keeping you on the same step you started on two years later <laughs> I don't know the circumstances of that so I, I really am hesitant to, to discuss it. It might be that your sponsor doesn't know the rest of the steps. It might be that you haven't gotten the one you're on. I, I don't have an answer to that. But I think saying stuck is not good in AA. What do you think? I think saying stuck is not good. We need to move and we need to move on and we need to improve and we need to change. And sometimes that takes a lot of people. I learned this weekend from some folks that if I were to need to ask some questions, I'd call maybe Steve, or I'd call Lou, or I'd call Nancy, or I'd call Mary, because we all hold each other's hearts and our, each other's lives in our hands, and we need to go where those answers are, and we, we land lightly. We land lightly. We take what is there, and then we move on, but we keep encouraging each other to move forward. What would you do with a sponsor who hasn't completed the step work and calls annually two, three months before an AA birthday? wanting you to give them tokens at celebrations. So I have a question for that. Have we substituted tokens for sobriety? Does my token mean more to me than the substance of what I'm doing? We spend about twice, three times as much money on chips as we do supporting GSO annually. Is my token more important than my sobriety? So we're big on celebration. How about our reality? Chris. You know, a couple of things that, uh, that were just discussed that uh, I'm thinking about is, you know, we all know, uh, we all know that there can be predators uh, in AA. Um, it can, and it can be of both sexes, trust me. Uh, uh, you know, it's not necessarily just a, a man thing. Mm -hmm. But I'll share one experience. Um, I met my home group, and there was a guy who, you know, there was some rumors around he would, uh, uh, that he would, you know, be with the little boys a little in, inappropriately. And we're at the meeting this one time. Uh, we're at this meeting this one time, and a guy, a, a, a boy that he had you know, been inappropriate with, grew up a little bit and got a little bit bigger and showed up at the meeting about three or four years later and, and grabbed this guy outside and, and, you know, started, started beating the crap out of him. And, uh, I was there with one of my, one of my sponsees and he was my sponsee. He was like a, a Marine, you know, big tough guy. And, uh, I said, I said, Liam, uh, in a few minutes, break that up. <laughs> you know? Folks, 
Folks, some people need a meeting, some people need a beating. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, l listen, think think about this. <laughs> Think about this. It's a tradition one issue. We need to have a safe environment. Does, does our rooms not need to be safe? Absolutely. So it's a tradition one. And in tradition one it says our group's welfare comes before personal welfare. That leads me to believe that when there's, when there's someone who is so tragically damaging to a group, they can be encouraged to leave. It's a tradition one issue. Uh, a split with a sponsor. I had this wonderful sponsor. Oh, my God, Fish Food Phil. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I did early on is I nicknamed everybody. You know, there was Bummed Out Bob and, you know, Radio Shack Mike and all these. They still, I feel, I feel terrible. Everybody's still called that. Uh, <laughs> guy hasn't worked for Radio Shack in 25 years, you know. It's still Radio Shack. Anyway. Uh, I was a piece of work. I, you know, I was no vision for you in my first year or two, I gotta tell you. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, it became time. It became time that I needed to split from my sponsor, my first sponsor. Now this guy saved my life, you know. He was so gentle and kind with me and he was so encouraging in the right direction. See he said, Chris, I want to see you at a meeting every night until I tell you to stop. And not only did he say that, but I would see him at the meeting every night. I mean, this guy, this guy truly, truly loved me. But, but what happened was he got involved with the horse crowd and some other things. He let some of the things that AA gave him take him away from AA, and he had stopped going to meetings. And I felt this intense loyalty to this guy. But I came to the conclusion that it's not good for me to continue to use a sponsor who's unplugged. And it's not good for him either. So, out of respect, I called a meeting, and we went to coffee, and, you know, I, I very, very lovingly said that, you know, I'm moving on, and I'm moving on to this individual. And he said, that's a great choice, Chris, you know, God, God bless you. And, and I think there's a lot of people that I sponsor who slide away like weasels, and, you know, I don't even know where they are or what they've done or whatever. That's, that's kind of disrespectful, especially when you've given them a lot of time. And, again, I have no ownership. If, if you're, if you're going to be moving on, oh, man, that's, that's great. And a lot of times when I've got sponsees year after year after year, I encourage them, if it's time for them to go through the steps again, I encourage them to do that with someone else so they can get another insight, a different experience. You know, we don't own these people. In the book Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, there's, I believe that I've read that there's three descriptions of the people we work with. One is a prospect, and a prospect is simply somebody who, who looks like, you know, they're a candidate for AA, and you go and you do your pitch. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the first and second visit and all that from working with others, but that's somebody who has potential, you know, to get sober. Then there's the protege. They call them the protege in the book. And that's the person who's working with you, working through the steps. And then the next description Bill uses is friend. You know, friend. They'll, they'll become your, your friend. Um, I really discourage somebody who's been, who's been my, you know, working with me years and years and years to call me up, you know, with, with the simple things. I mean, I, I'm not the answer man. I'm more, you know, I'm more of the channel to the answer man, you know, and, uh, and again, we, we develop wonderful relationships. The, the best friends in my life today are the people, uh, you know, who I've, who I've really experienced uh, reco recovery with. Here's another thing that I'll do. Let's say somebody's non-compliant. They'll tell you to your face that, yeah, I'm working on that four step, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that, or, you know, they're misbehaving in meetings. I have what I call an exit interview. Uh, I've learned this from business, <laughs> you know. I have an exit interview, and I sit them down, and I go, I go look, certain things are, are really necessary in Alcoholics Anonymous to have an, a successful experience. Here are the things that I think are necessary that you're not doing. A, B, C, D, you know, and, and that's, that's my exit interview. And I, ba I basically say, you know, are you willing to get going on this stuff? And one of two things will happen. 
One of them is they'll start to get willing and they'll start to do these things and they'll start making an effort. And the other one is they'll disappear from me like a plague. And folks, either one of those is fine. You know, I, I don't have ownership. The only requirement for membership in AA is a desire to stop drinking. They are totally welcome in the meetings. They're totally welcome to work with other people. My time is valuable. I need to be spending it on the people who are going to be compliant and that are going to really try. The book tells me that. It tells me do not waste time with people who are not willing to work with, work with you. I'm going to go to chapter working with others. Is that okay, G? Yeah, but let's you got something else? Yeah, okay. I just want to read this from... Sure. There's a motivation. There's a reason for some of what we do, and I'm sure you all know all of this already, but back in the doctor's opinion, it starts talking about how we're different. And he says some things that have always really triggered me into um, understanding Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of them is a simple little hidden phrase, and it says, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Now, I don't very often wake up in the middle of the night excited and thrilled and awakened by the adrenaline charge of the powers of good. I'm the kind of person that wakes up angry, wanting to know how long it's going to take to smother Lou before dawn. You know, <laughs> it's kind of how I am when I, you know, in the middle of the night I wake up in fear. I wake up in anger. However, this is what reminds me to get back to what it is we are at our essence. The powers of good are a powerful thing, and I forget them. I just forget them. Same page, it says, it tells us who we are, the unselfishness of these men as we have come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive, and their community and spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labeled long, labored long and wearily in the alcoholic field. They believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. There's lots of challenges in here. Is that me? Is that me? Is that what I'm taking out into my world? There's lots of specific ways that I get to address this, and most of those ways are addressed in the book, but it calls me to bring to this the power that was not mine when I got here, the power of good, an absolute power of good. How does it feel to have that kind of access to that kind of power? We can do so much more than I ever could waking up in the middle of the night smothered in my own fear. So, go Chris. So, when I first started working with others, you know, um, it was very early in the 90s, uh, there weren't any, any big book meetings or any real serious big book influence in my area. It was 12 and 12 land, you know, and uh, I was going to maybe four 12 and 12 meetings a week. A and that, that can kind of skew your perspective a little bit on, on the actual spiritual mechanics of, of the steps. It's a wonderful book. It helps us broaden and deepen the concepts as they're laid out in the book, but it's the sequel. You know, you don't start with the, the sequel. As I got exposed to the book Alcoholics Anonymous, I remember reading, working with others and saying, oh my God, you know, they did that? That seems pretty extreme. We tell them to go to a meeting and, you know, we, we share. I, you know, so what happened was my evolution with the book and the recovery program, I started to pay more and more attention to the chapter working with others. And I started to shift the way I sponsored more closely to align with the chapter working with others. You know, how revolutionary to actually use the chapter called working with others for working with others. It was revolutionary, in, you know, in, in, our, in our area. Anyway. Oh, God, I remember. I'm going to get sidetracked here. I started a riot. Uh, in, at the New Jersey State Convention uh, one, one year. Uh, and, and here's basically how it happened. I, I, was asked, I was asked to be part of the Alcathon. The Alcathon was 12 hours, 12 steps. And I had the 11 o'clock at night, step 12. And, and I was given 20 minutes to share. So here's how I did it. I spent the first 10 minutes talking about my experience going through 1 through 11. And then the, the last 10 minutes, I... I talked about how I worked with others. And there was a grumpy kind of guy that was in that meeting that was kind of taking exception.
reaction to what I was talking about. And as soon as he had a chance to, he shared. And it was like this. Yo, kid, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. All this steps and all this crap. You know, you sound like a bad therapist. I, mean, I don't know where all these, like, first out all this stuff. Let me tell you what I do. I throw them in a car, and I take them to a meeting, and I love them until they can love themselves. And all this other stuff is all this stuff. And, uh... I wasn't so recovered at that period of time uh, <laughs> that I was going to just allow that to pass. Uh, and, and because I was leading the meeting, I did have, have rebuttal rights, you know. So basically what I said was, uh, you know, uh, Clem, thank you very much for, for, for that, uh, that opinion of yours, you know. Um, uh, very, I find it very interesting. Um, however... <laughs> There is a chapter in our book, Working with Others, that specifically lays out what we're supposed to be doing. And you know what? I'm pretty familiar with that chapter. And I don't remember throwing people in cars, and I don't remember loving them until they love themselves. And he freaked out. He said, God damn it. He gets up, he starts kicking tables over and throwing chairs. <laughs> Oh my God! It was like the the the, the meeting chair goes meetings over meetings and people blowing for the exits. It was it was unbelievable. So I've become more subtle, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know w w when I have to uh, when I have to correct someone, uh, you know, I'm I'm much more subtle today. Anyway, let's jump to chapter seven. This is chapter seven. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. I'll ask this question. If it's the working with others that ensures immunity from drinking, why are we telling people not to work with anybody for a year? You know, we're, we're, we're unplugging them from the life support if, 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 we're, if we're doing that. Now, does that mean that they need to you know, be sponsoring and taking people through the steps like right away. No, but the, the most important thing in my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous was when my sponsor had me do something for fun and for free, not expecting anything back in return. That was revolutionary to me. I couldn't understand why anyone would do that. I had heard about Mother Teresa and things like that, but, but I, you know, that... That's not what I thought, you know, look, it's, why would I do something if there's not some kind of payback, uh, you know, why? And, and so he said, Chris, this is what I want you to do, you know, I want you to clean up here, I want you to go cook there. And what it did was it started to get me out, out of myself. If selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of our illness, then, then becoming <coughs> rid of that bondage of self is part of the solution. You know, so right away, you can do something. You, can, you know, the, the guy who doesn't have the driver's license or, you know, whatever. You can, you can help other alcoholics. You, you, can, you can either carry the message to the alcoholic or you can carry the alcoholic to the message. You know, you may be able to carry the alcoholic to the message a long time before you're able to actually carry the message to them. But you need to be busy trying to, to be of help. They start right off with a paragraph of uh, promises. Life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch the loneliness vanish, and to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. I am telling you, folks, we create the fellowship we crave when we start to take people through the steps, walk with them through this process. We, we start to create the fellowship we crave. And that's what I want today. That's what I want today. I want, I want to be part of humanity again. You know, I was so cut off from it. I was so alien to, you know, society and, and to all of you. Uh, I, I need to get back out of the dark and head back into the sunlight of the spirit where you are. You know, and that's a very, very important thing. Now, this book was written when there was two groups. And they gave you a lot of instructions in where and how to find alcoholics. You know, where do you, where do you find them? How, you know, how do you begin to work with them? There's great information in here. A lot of us have stopped even trying to do this because all of our stuff is in AA. You know, we wait for them to come in to AA. I'll tell you what, if each one of us in this room would follow these directions and go seek out 
a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous in the drunk tanks, at the hospitals, in the prisons, and get one person into Alcoholics Anonymous in a year, we could double our fellowship. You, you, you know what I mean? It would be such a wonderful thing if we went back to these basics and really started to take them literally. Okay, you found somebody. You found somebody. It says if there's any indication that he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested in him. Get an idea of his behavior, his problems, his background. I do this with the family. A lot of times I'm brought in front of people, you know, for the 12-step work by a family. I want to know a little bit about them first. I want them to be able to identify with, with me. So it's important for me to know a little bit about them. It says here, sometimes it's wise to wait till they go on a bench. Why is it wise to wait for somebody to go on a bench? Because desperation dissipates. You go on one more bender, you're in one more jackpot, you're out of the big bed one more time, you know, you've lost your job, you've got another DUI. That is a really good time to be talking to somebody because they're going to be willing to listen. You know what I mean? So it's, it's telling us, you know, don't, don't push this too hard with these people. If he does not want to see you, never force yourself upon him. Uh, again, I believe our public relations policy is attraction, not promotion. I believe, though, that on our 12-step calls, we do promote. We talk about our experience, our strength, and our hope. And within that, is some serious promotion. I, buddy, I was just like you. You got to understand. I, I know exactly how you feel. You know, here's some of my own experience. And you tell them some stuff, and you know, it might be the first time they realize that there's somebody that understands. And then, you, then you tell them, I'm not like that anymore. You know, I've found a solution. And when they believe that when we're authentic enough and they believe that, that is a wonderful opportunity to gain some, gain some willingness, gain some participation, and get working, uh, working with somebody. Uh, see your man alone if possible. Uh, at first, engage in general conversation. This is the first visit. It's got the first visit in here and the second visit. It tells us what to do. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him about your own drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences, and encourage him to speak of himself. You know, let's, let's get sharing here about what's, what's going on. Um, if he's not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time, but say nothing at the moment about how that was accomplished. It's like you're throwing the bait in the water when you're doing this, you know. I drunk, buddy, I was just like you. Oh, my God, you know, three DUIs, you know, families leaving me, just drinking alone, uh, terrible depression, you know, uh, all this stuff. And, uh, and then let them, if they will, ask you, well, what happened? You know, why aren't you like that anymore? Strike. You got them. You know what I mean? And now, now you can start reeling them in. And you can start talking about the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and its 12-step program of recovery. Um, if you are satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, to, to begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. This got me in trouble one time. Um, I showed up in a meeting. I was traveling. I was going through North Carolina. And I showed up in a meeting. that the, It said there was a meeting, and the meeting book said it, right? But there was no meeting there anymore, and somebody else had made the exact same mistake. He just got out of prison, and he was looking for a meeting, and he had an old meeting book. So we're both standing in front of this church door that's never going to open. And so I say to him, hey, you know, listen, why don't we just go get a coffee, coffee over at Denny's, and we can talk. And he's like, sure. And he's got, he's got his, uh, his wife with him, and uh, we, I've got my wife with me, and we both go over to Denny's. And I start to do exactly what the book says. I start to dwell on the hopeless nature of the malady. And I wasn't very practiced at it. I basically was telling him, you know, you're going to drink yourself to death. It's going to be, it's going to be hell. No, no matter how bad it is now, it's going to get worse. And this is a prison guy, right? He looks me right in the eyes and he goes, I usually kill people that give me bad news. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, waitress, check. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> this 12-step call is over. Uh, you know, 
Oh, I'm doing this for fun and for free, not to die. <laughs> Show him from your own experience how the queer mental condition surrounding the first, uh, uh, the first normal functioning. Talk about the obsession of the mind. Talk about how much you, you knew alcohol, knew drinking alcohol was hurting you. And how many times you actually honestly tried. And how you found out you couldn't. Talk about that powerlessness. Sometimes, sometimes it's the first time they even hear that concept. I was working with somebody one time. He was a relapser out of the veterans hospital in our area. And I started going over this stuff and he started crying. This like war vet, you know, right in my house starts crying. He goes, oh my God, this is the first time anybody's ever explained this to me. You know, I thought I was crazy. You know, and he became a wonderful AA member. Once he realized what was going on, he was, he was all in. Um, tell, him, tell him exactly what happened to you. Spe stress the spiritual feature freely. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make an emphatic that he does not have to agree, agree with your conception of God. He can choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. The main thing is that he be willing to uh, believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. I used to hear in the early meetings around my area, don't talk about God, don't bring up God in the beginner's meeting, you'll drive him away. Folks, if talking about God drives them away, alcohol, drive them right back in. <laughs> you know, wh why would we hide the power from these people? You know, why would we hide the solution from these people? It's a connection. It's a connection to God that's going to enable us to become happily and usefully whole. Oh, are you about done? Yeah. Oh, my God. Coordination is so essential. I was listening to Chris and I was thinking two things I want to say and one is that I'm not a person who hears jargon. Please don't throw jargon at me. You go out and find somebody who's sniveling and drunk and feeling sorry for themselves and full of self-pity and you start talking about incomprehensible demoralization and the, um, the jargon that we talk about within the group. We are speaking a foreign tongue to most people. Speak English. Speak English. Do not throw program jargon at people who don't have any idea what you're saying. They don't have a connection to that. So I think it's really useful if we try to remember <coughs> that when we start here, we're just talking street talk. We haven't got all of that wordage down. And we meet people where they are because Alcoholics Anonymous takes people as they are when they get here. You don't have to be better to get better. You just where you are when you get here, and, and we don't start throwing the things we've learned here at people when they're walking in the door. And I would suggest that to be perhaps a little helpful at putting yourself in another person's place. Folks, there's a lot of stuff we weren't able to cover. I have questions here. They're fabulous questions. When can a newcomer date? That would take the next session. Um, <laughs> talk to your sponsor. Um, but I think it's really important that when we're talking with people, we remember that as a new person, take yourself back to being a new person. Do not ta don't be so spiritual that you're of no earthly good. Uh, we are alcoholics, meeting people where they are when they come in, right where they're at. We have an answer but we don't bludgeon somebody into that answer. I think it's if we're really skilled, we help people find the willingness to hear what we have to say. Because they're going to be here with luck the rest of their lives. We've got time to let it grow. One of my early sponsors said something that we've stopped doing is to we used to surround somebody and just walk with them for a while while they figure out whether they want what you have. We don't say that somebody walking in the door. Do you want what we have? And we used to have a place um, for other reasons. It was called the DPR York Street in Denver. And, um, it, and it, people would talk about coming up the, bri the big broad stairway of this old, old club in Denver. 
and it's a great wide stairway and inside there'd be a whole row of people and there's a row of guys sitting there and some of them are kind of palsied and some are and then one somebody's got one eye and and he's saying sonny if you want what i have and they went no <laughs> said, no i do not want what you have so we got to be a little bit careful with some of that stuff um So what I want to say is that the book is filled with advice for how to sponsor others. It starts at the beginning and it works all the way through. It's not only and it works with others. Those are specifics. Thank you for going through that. The book talks a lot about other ways. Stuff like Bill says when he was being 12-stepped. My gin would last longer than his ranting. So what's our lesson? We do no ranting. But he did no ranting. We talk about the examples of Jim and the examples of the salesman and it says we told him what we knew of alcoholism and the answer we had found. So there's lots of instruction throughout the book. This is a great textbook on how to work with others. If it is nothing else, it is a great textbook on how to do that. And so Bill says we do, and, and one point that I think... Um, that I didn't hear for a really long time, Bill says we're going to talk about things spiritual, moral, mental, physical. We hope we don't offend anyone, but they need to be talked about. So I have discovered through really um, painful experience that it is really important for me not to be talking about sectarian religion or politics, and I say that particularly in 2016. <laughs> I don't wear pins, I don't wear buttons, I don't wear car things, I don't... I like to come with none of the stuff that would alienate me from a newcomer who finds one more reason to be separate because I'm a whatever I am. You can be too much or too little. You can be uh, very political. But I've lost sponsees that I really deeply cared about over issues of growing religious or political differences. When I come to AA, I don't wear a hat with a button in it. I don't. It's my personal choice. I try on my Facebook not to give you one of my many important opinions. Um, I try really hard to keep all of that stuff off because why I'm going to eventually perhaps be talking to somebody who asked for my Facebook page and I will have declared all of my opinions in such force that I've just done this with somebody that I really want to be able to approach with an open heart. So I try really hard to follow the suggestion and the traditions that says I have no opinion on outside issues. I am at my best when I have no opinion on outside issues, even though you all know I have lots of opinions on almost anything, whether I know about it or not. <coughs> Lack of knowledge is not my issue. I have an opinion anyway. <laughs> so... I think it's really important for me to remember that if I'm going to approach someone or if someone's going to approach me or if I'm going to be approachable, if I'm going to talk to a medical group, if I'm going to go talk to a prison, I don't lead out with what differences I can find between us. I want myself to be available bigger than myself. We were talking about that and our speaker so beautifully talked about it last night. I want to be bigger than I am. I want to be better than I am. And so I leave all of that stuff that I've learned at home because the powers of good transcend my learned knowledge. So that's, that's the one thing I would like to, to suggest that especially in this particular year um, that we leave that aside when we come to Alcoholics Anonymous and we find refreshing in our meetings the fact that none of that is the topic. None of that is even a subject for discussion. So that my sponsees and I, whatever our background, whatever our framework, whatever our political leanings, we're able to approach each other under the one thing that unites us. Our tradition one is about unity. And it is not about all the other stuff that divides us. So that, of course, is my personal opinion. <coughs> you, wanna, you want me to go on? So... It's 9.30, we're about to end. And I really want to say a very big thank you to all the people that have been so gracious to us both over the weekend. Chris invited me to join him. This is Chris's show, and I thank you for that. 
Um, Steve, where are you, Steve Lee? You've been fabulous, and so many other people, friends of Chris's that have come up and worked hard to make us welcome. Um, I'm a big book person. I sponsor out of the big book. My sponsees are big book women. They sponsor out of the big book. And um, that's because that was what was given to me. And as we were having breakfast, Pete suggested a great closing thing that would be would be nice to read, would be from page 100 of our big book on working with others. Among all the things that we do, it says, let no alcoholic say he cannot recover unless he has his family back. This just isn't so. In some cases, the wife will never come back for one reason or another. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. It's most certainly not dependent on me. We have seen men get well whose families have not returned at all. We have seldom seen, we have seen others slip when the family came back too soon. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. <clears throat> Follow the dictates of a higher power, and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstances we must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. I thank you for enriching my life. <clears throat>